Hey everybody, it's Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We want to welcome you to this video. My purpose in doing this video is last Sunday on September 10, we resumed our From This Generation Forever class after taking a break for, for the summer and we encountered a technical problem uh, as far as the streaming and recording of that. So what I wanted to do is just jump on here and just make a quick, maybe 15 minute overview video so that we have it in the series and then i'll commend to you the rest of the notes here uh, for you to kind of go through on your own if you're interested in doing so uh lesson 210 was uh we're, we're in the segment still where we're looking at the av 1611 as a historical artifact and so we were looking at page layout and topography in lesson 210 and so we started by kind of recapping what we did in the last term of the class from September 2022 through June 2023. We spent six lessons looking at the general meeting in the notes of John Boyce. We looked at Richard Bancroft, Thomas Bilson, Miles Smith, and the finishing touches on the AV. We looked at Bancroft's 14 changes um, and the question of authorization. We looked at confronting the copyright myth and early 17th century printing. We did a little more on the copyright myth, and we looked at a 1612 New Testament in Lesson 188. We looked at the first edition and the he-she Bible controversy in Lesson 189. That's the one related to Ruth there, and uh, what, which which edition is the first edition and the, the, the different she-he uh, readings, and we talked about that in Lesson 189. Then in lesson, uh, in lesson 190, we started looking at the 1611, assessing its preliminary contents. We spent three lessons doing that, and then we ended with a 17-part uh, exhaustive study on producing a proper perspective on the preface. And so that's what we were doing um, in the last term. As we start the new term, we're still continuing to look at the AV, the publication of the AV, a historical artifact. We're still doing that here in lesson 210. So we've been endeavoring to try to explore the 1611 as an as an artifact of history, as well as ascertain the readings and and you know things related to its history and why it is significant. And in lesson 210 from last Sunday, we looked at uh, two two issues, and that's page layout and topography, and initials and spacing. So in uh, full transparency, we're using chapter three of Dr. David Norton's 2005 publication, Textual History of the King James Bible. Uh, and that chapter is titled The First Edition. And there's a subsection in there titled A Specimen Page in which Dr. Norton breaks down the topography and layout of a sample page from a folio uh, from the folio of 1611. And uh, I have some images here below. We're just going to kind of go through this. Now, I'm not going to read all this. I've got some things marked and highlighted on my paper copy that I have in front of me. And I'm going to point them out to you here on the sample pages as we go through. So again, this is not going to be every word. It's just going to be some high points, some things to consider in summary of what we went through in this lesson originally. So the text presented within the borders. So you can see the borders here. This is all laid out in border, top margin, bottom margin, side margin, etc. Okay. Uh, it, uh, with space delineated for headers and for annotations. So you have a header on every page. And on the right and left margin, you have um, marginal notes and notes and th those kinds of things, okay? Each ruled area was set separately, so the text for each one of these ruled sections, as you can see on the screen, was set separately. The first two columns of the text were set, then spaced out uh, as necessary with wooden blocks. The marginal notes and references were added, and also the headers. The separation of these steps may occasionally have been, may have occasionally contributed to errors, such as the misplacement or the omission of a note or a reference, okay? So um, on the recto page, have a chapter heading in the middle, okay? So we could go look at that here. Um, let me make sure I get this right. The chapter number, excuse me, the chapter number. So that's this page right here. You can see the chapter number here in Roman numerals, okay? Well, the verso page has the name of the book. So the name of the book is centered here at the top of this page, like we see here with Genesis, okay? Usually, but not always, the chapter number, uh, usually, but not always, the chapter number is the number of chapter beginning on that page, okay? So here we have, um, on this page, we have in, in uh, Roman numerals 16, 
And we can see here that chapter 16 begins on this page. So that's the general format that they used here as far as laying things out. Okay. It's usually the case, but not always. The margin is used for three different kinds of annotation. They are literal translations designated by a dagger. Okay, so we can look at a dagger here, and we can see dagger Hebrew, and it's giving a literal translation of the Hebrew um, for two different words here in um, Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. So there's daggers to represent um, literal translations. There are English renderings with double lines, alternative English renderings. So here we have this. It, where it relates to the double vertical line here, um, perfect or upright, okay? So it's giving an alternative English reading there in that case. Meanwhile, cross-references are denoted with an asterisk, okay? So here's an asterisk in the text, text and it relates to uh, this asterisk here, chapter 5, uh, verse 22. So there's three different types of marginal notes. There's, again, the dagger for... Uh, the literal translation, there's a double vertical line sig signifying an alternative English rendering, and then the cross references are noted with an asterisk. Okay. Now, there are also, you can see here with chapter 16, there is a summary of the chapter. So there are chapter summaries, um, just giving a brief word of, of what's going on in a given chapter. And then at the bottom of every page, there's a catch word. Okay. Now we can see that a little bit more clearly if we go to our first example here. So notice the catch word obtain. And then if we come to the top of the next page, you'll find the word obtain. So it's a little unclear. Even, even Norton is a little bit baffled to some extent why this is happening. Okay, uh, What he says about this, the catch word at the bottom of the page in the right-hand column has a line to itself, something the printer could vary, uh, vary according to the demands of space. But there is a catch word there that needs to be noted. The other thing you need to note is the first initial or letter of a chapter is characterized with a character that is five lines deep. So here's chapter 16, the word, the letter A for and, and you'll see one, two, three, four, five lines deep is the, um, the initial, the drop cap, I guess, for lack of a better term. And then the second letter is also capitalized. And this seems to be consistent throughout the 1611 AV. All right, there are also several points uh, to note about the text, perhaps the most important feature is the presentation of words that now appear in italics at 16.6. So let's go to chapter 16, verse 6. Okay. Uh, ba -ba -ba, let me make sure. All right, I found it. I was apologize. I was looking in the wrong spot. So here's chapter 16, verse 6. You can see the word is here is in small Roman font. Now, that is the equivalent in the day in the early 17th century. The, the, the convention the King James translator, the, the printer used, was to set words that are now in italics into small Roman print. Okay. And uh, what Norton says about this at 16.6 is as given in small Roman type. Visually, it appears to de-emphasize exactly the opposite to the effect of italics used for such words uh, in Roman type in all modern editions. So obviously in a modern printing of the King James, is is going to be in italics, not in small Roman font. But that was the convention there that was used at the time. The other thing to note here is uh, Norton identifies and says that the identification of added words is inconsistent and incomplete in the 1611. So in other words, um, not all of the italicization or the small Roman font is consistent throughout the first edition. He also brings out that paragraphs are noted by paragraph marks. Okay, uh, so we could see here this is um, chapter 16, verse 4. There's a paragraph mark here. There's a paragraph mark also on verse 7. And this is one of the curiosities of the King James Bible. Paragraph, there are no paragraph marks after Acts 20. Uh, only one in Psalms and six throughout the whole of the Apocrypha. So even paragraph markings are, 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 are uneven in the printing of the 1611. Okay, um, Like the identification of the added words, this bespeaks incomplete work. Now, I, I plan on doing a lesson at some point, just on the issue of italics, um, 
just just because I think there's some interesting things that we need to observe there about about how that was done. Um, there are what appear to be printer errors. Uh, appear to be because there are two areas of doubt. First, the error may come from the copy the printer worked from, in which case it is not his error. Second, it may not actually be an error. So he talks about 17.4. So let's look here at 17.4, all right? So you'll notice here, okay, so let me make sure I get this right. 17.4, there's an asterisk before father, okay? So notice there's an asterisk here before father, but then there's no corresponding asterisk in the margin, okay? There's no corresponding asterisks in the margin. Um, and then you'll also notice that, uh, let me make sure I get this right, um, there's an asterisk before father, but no cross-reference in the margin. In the next line of the verse, there's a double vertical line where there should be a dagger in the margin. So you'll notice here there's a double vertical line, but this should be a dagger in the text because there's a dagger in the margin because it's giving the Hebrew... Uh, literal Hebrew rendering, and the convention was to use the dagger for that. So there's, you know, there's there's things like this that are just sort of inconsistent in the first printing. Uh, the latter is a printer's error. So this is clearly a printer error. This should have been a dagger. It's not. It's it's the double vertical line, which is the wrong convention to signify that 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 type of marginal note. Okay, um, but it's possible that the asterisk before father without a corresponding reference could have been a problem with the copy, the translator, the, the typesetter, the printer was working off of. Either way, one might suspect that as a repetition of, um, so he, he kind of gets into a little speculation there. Um, one of the things to note is just spelling. Uh, most people who are familiar with the 1611 are aware of spelling. Um, the spelling conventions are not uniform and they are not consistent throughout. Even certain words are spelled differently within the same verse. Um, and so there's some, you, you could look at some reasons for why that is. Although sometimes it's, it's, we're probably going to be just left with some amount of speculation. Now, the other thing I just want to touch on is the second point, And that is, large drop caps or initials and spacing okay now one aspect of the topography so we're going to actually jump here now into this website which allows us to look at um actual images of every page so one of the things that norton talks about is the initials and spacing so we talked already about the beginning of every chapter but at the beginning of every book, there is also a large drop cap. And this time it is, I believe, nine lines deep. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's, it's nine lines deep, so it's bigger. Okay, So the large initials are nine lines deep and normally found at the beginning of the books. By contrast with the initials for chapters, which uh, generally have a double border. Okay, Now let's look at that. Um generally have a double border. Some of the books are given smaller initials for regions of space, Obadiah, Micah, uh, those have smaller ones. And so he's just noting differences in the drop caps uh, between the beginning of the chapter and also the beginning of the book. And then he also knows that there are some strange figures, um, strange initials that have pan figures in them. Okay, so we could go to Let's go to Romans 1. Romans 1. So just bear with me for a minute while I find that. We'll go to Romans chapter 1. And we can observe that there are pan or mythical figures um, in some of the drop caps at the beginning of the chapters. And so we're just, again, going through some of the features. So you can see here um, in Romans chapter 1. Uh, ba, ba, ba. here we go. You can see the pan figures here that are in the um, drop cap for Romans chapter 1. Also notice now that this one is bordered when the one in Genesis chapter 1 wasn't. So what this signifies is that the printer is, is, is probably short on characters for some things, particularly if he had multiple presses running the AV in 1611, which is probably the case. And so uh, some of the chap, some of the some of the figures, some of the drop caps, et cetera, and spacing is inconsistent throughout the AV. Okay, and there are these strange 
strange figures like we see here with this P. Then the only other thing to mention for them, lesson 210 is um, the there's a compression of spacing at the end of the apocrypha to get the apocrypha to so the apocryphal section ends and there's a compression of spacing i'm not going to get into a long thing about this you can read about it in the notes uh, if you want to but the compression of spacing is done and i i do agree with norton about this so that the apocryphal section will end at a given spot in the choir so that the New Testament section could be printed separate from the Apocrypha. So in other words, so the end of the Apocrypha wouldn't spread over into a whole new choir. So a choir is a is is how the book is made and sewn together and how the pages are folded and printed on, etc. Um, but you can see here in this image that the Apocrypha ends here, end of the Apocrypha, and right away there's a beginning of a new choir over here that begins the New Testament. And so Norton makes the point that there's some things that are done by the printer on this last page of the Apocrypha to compress the spacing so that it will end here on at the end of this page and not spill over into the beginning of a new choir. OK, so uh, those are just a, a high point of what we talked about in Lesson 210. Uh, if you would like to read all these notes, certainly avail yourself of them. They're available for you to read and study and check out for yourself. And hopefully we don't have any technical problems this morning when we go for lesson 211, which is going to be about errors of the press, printer errors in the 1611. So thanks for watching this quick video, and hopefully we'll see you uh, in class here later this morning. Thanks for your attention. We'll see you next time.